Thank you, Dr. Ehrlich. Uh, it is my pleasure today to present on behalf of the APSA Cancer Committee on the topic of rhabdomyosarcoma, 50 years of progress through cooperative study. 50 years ago, at the time of APSA's founding, three quarters of children with rhabdomyosarcoma would die from their disease. The rare survivors came from the 25% of patients who had fully resectable tumors. During the 1960s, the efficacy of single agents was documented, but it wasn't until Wilbur et al began giving the combination of VAC therapy that survival benefits were shown. The intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma study group was formed in the early 1970s, and this paved the way for five decades of cooperative study. This began with IRS and proceeded through the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee of COG. Between 1972 and 1997, IRS enrolled over 4,000 patients on four different studies. During this time, five-year survival improved from 55% to 71%. However, the group studied multiple different chemotherapy agents and found no benefit compared to standard VAC therapy. However, multiple other lessons were learned from these first four studies, including important local control questions. We learned that re-excision of incompletely excised tumor is beneficial if form and function can be preserved, that the eye, vagina, and bladder can usually be saved, that radiation can be emitted for children with localized, completely excised embryonal rhabdo, and that most patients with alveolar rhabdo have a tumor-specific translocation. Finally, we learned that mature rhabdomyoblasts are common after treatment of bladder rhabdo and are not necessarily malignant. A better understanding of risk stratification has been one of the key breakthroughs during the past 50 years. We now understand that there are multiple key pieces making up the risk stratification puzzle. And these include histology, clinical group, location, size, age, nodal status, fusion status, and whether or not there's metastatic disease. By putting these pieces together, we can assign a risk group. And this risk group reliably predicts outcome and forms the basis for stratifying patients on the recent and current studies. Beginning with IRS-5 in 1998, the studies were stratified by risk assignments. For the low-risk group, the goal was to reduce therapy while, making, while maintaining excellent survival, and this proved feasible. In the intermediate group, yet another chemotherapy agent, this time topotecan, was studied and showed no benefit compared to standard VAC therapy. However, in the high-risk group, there was some additional benefit to the addition of arenotecan. After the inception of COG and the transfer of studies into the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee, this model of risk stratified study was continued. For patients with low risk disease, further refinement of risk classification allowed for improved survival with further therapy reduction. For those with intermediate risk disease, VAC-VI had comparable outcomes, but with reduced toxicity when compared to standard VAC therapy. However, this intermediate risk study demonstrated the potential downside of therapy reduction. Although results were comparable in both arms of this study, when you compared the results to historical controls, the older D9803 study, uh, both event-free and overall survival were worse. There were several possible explanations for this, but the most likely culprit is the reduction in the cyclophosphamide dose. And you can see in this graph the, the cyclophosphamide doses over the different studies. Other possible contributors could include a, a de-emphasis of delayed primary excision as well as changes in the radiation timing. The current intermediate risk study is investigating the benefit of adding the mTOR inhibitor, temsirolimus, which has showed promise in earlier phase studies. And the recently completed high-risk study showed no benefit with an altered chemotherapy regimen. However, COG is not the only study group addressing these important, this important topic. Other breakthroughs have come from the German study group, the European Soft Tissue Study Group, and the International Society of Pediatric Oncology. Most notably, EPSSG recently demonstrated improved event-free and overall survival with the addition of maintenance therapy at the end of standard treatment. This was one of the first real chemother chemotherapy breakthroughs in recent decades, and this component was recently amended onto both arms of the current COG intermediate risk um, trial. Next, we will hone in on progress in local control for rhabdo. It is first important to understand the nomenclature of the different surgery time points. 
Oftentimes, primary excision is performed prior to establishing the diagnosis. In these cases, primary re-excision can be performed to achieve negative margins, and clinical group is determined after PRE. In some cases, delayed primary excision can be considered after 12 weeks of induction chemotherapy. Although DPE doesn't alter the clinical group, it can allow for reduction in radiation dose, as we'll talk about in a moment. Excision of residual mass at the end of therapy is generally not indicated because it is not associated with significant, it is associated with significant morbidity without any documented survival benefits. Remember that residual mass at the end of therapy does not necessarily equate to viable tumor. Each of the recent intermediate risk studies has addressed a specific local control question. In IRS-4, there was no benefit to hyperfractionation of radiation therapy when compared to standard once-daily treatment. The role of DPE was addressed in D9803, and I'll talk about that momentarily. In 0531, we studied the benefit of earlier initiation of radiation at four weeks, as is often done in several head and neck tumors, and showed no benefit to standard timing at 10 weeks. I'd like to go back to the benefit of DPE. This was considered in D9803 for patients with bladder dome, trunk, and extremity tumors. Most patients were able to achieve R0, and R1, or R0 or R1 resections and thus have a reduction in their radiation dose with very comparable outcomes compared to patients who did not have DPE and had full dose radiation. Besides these important lessons, there have been other valuable local control nuggets gleaned from the past 50 years of studies. We now know that over half of operative bed recurrences occur in patients who did not receive protocol RT, that size greater than five centimeters is the biggest contributor to local failure, and that response status at the end of therapy for group three patients is not, is not associated with failure-free survival or death. We have also gleaned important nuggets about regional disease. We know that regional lymph node status alters prognosis for alveolar, but not embryonal rhabdo, that boys older than 10 with paratesticular rhabdo are more likely to have retroperitoneal nodes, and that sentinel lymph node biopsy has better sensitivity and specificity when compared to FDG PET uh, for tumors involving the extremities. In many ways, the evolution of surgical practice over the past 50 years has shown that less is more. We have learned to avoid amputation and pelvic exoneration. We have learned that for some patients, radiation can be definitive lo local control and no surgery is required. It has been shown time and again that debulking surgery for rhabdo is not beneficial. Biopsy has become less invasive with the advent of percutaneous core, and we have learned to avoid radical end-of-therapy resections. <clears throat> However, we have also identified some areas where we can do more as surgeons to benefit our patients. We have shown the benefit of sentinel node biopsy and learned to utilize brachytherapy for female GU tumors. We have demonstrated the value of multiple, multidisciplinary preoperative discussions and the importance of fertility preservation, consultation, and procedures. Safe surgical resection has been aided by new technologies like nerve monitoring, and emphasis on protocol adherence has helped to improve outcomes. I'm going to leave you with one random tidbit. We have also learned that, ra that an incomplete immunization schedule and incomplete DPT schedule particularly are associated with an increased risk of rhabdomyosarcoma. So with that, I thank you.